Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Ford, featuring voice activated sync app link. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out in the 2012 Ford Fiesta and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 20% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE11. Stop talking, Rick. And a man there. A scientist. Rick, I have five minutes of battery left. He told me. Rick! Rick, it's my... It doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is we're moving on. Atlanta's done. You can't do that! I'm gonna try for Fort Benning. You said use the walkie-talkie. We're facing a long... You, you... Hard... I assumed you knew how to use it. Journey. Stay off the road. Off the roads, copy. Moving. Keep your eyes open. My eyes are open, Rick. Move. I don't know, just... Rick Crimes, you... You're a policeman! You know how walkie-talkies work! Just be safe. I'm not safe, they're zombies! Rick, signing off. Get your finger off the button! <laughs> Rick! <laughs> Rick! Oh, you didn't just hang up, Rick. You can't do that. You can't talk to somebody for 10 minutes straight and not let them talk over. See how I just paused over? I'm giving you a chance to talk, Rick. Where's my chance to talk, Rick? I don't care about your problems, Rick. It's frame rate time. Sound very mellow. Welcome to frame rate. Great Episode show. fifty. Hello, ladies. <laughs> Pull up a drink and sit down. And sit down on a chair. Get ready to <laughs> rate some frames. <laughs> Man, you you sound like you're downbeat. You have a low energy this go around. You're just very chill. Yeah, no, I'm relaxed. Isn't that good? That's good. Uh, you're not high, are you? <laughs> so stoned right now. <laughs> I don't even know what studio. Look, our, our our guest has already uh, hung up on us. <laughs> He's like, I, "What is this shenanigans? <laughs> I'm out." <laughs> Who are these people? Uh, welcome to episode 50 of Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt, of course. Brian Brushwood with me, with me, and uh, with us, we're very happy to have a producer from Trigger Street. Uh, you might also know him from his work on the Social Network and uh, upcoming House of Cards, Mr. Dana Brunetti. Hey guys, thanks uh, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. It was uh, it was great talking to Dana on triangulation uh, re recently, and we mentioned frame rate, uh, and we figured who better uh, to help us talk about some of these issues that we talk about all the time. So let's get started with the big story. This just in the big story. Uh, this comes from Paid Content Entertainment 2011, uh, where they were having a, dis a discussion about uh, the disruption of technology in the entertainment industry. And the headline of the, the lead paragraph says, the same kind of disruption that changed the tech world is coming to television and films, according to panelists. Uh, when the cost of producing content plummet at the same time, demand for content has never been higher. A whole new class of entrants has a chance to make a splash. Uh, which is exactly the kind of stuff we've been talking about a lot on this show. People saying, you know what, if the industry is going to drag their heels on distribution and putting things in our hands, maybe people should just go out and start making stuff on their own. Well, and plus also, you got to remember there's another vector where to a certain class of people, it's just as fun to tell a good story as it is to uh, enjoy a good story. And when you have something that so many people want to do for free, that's part of the reason, like, um, uh, when I think of the two toughest industries to start from nothing and end up winning, the, the two toughest tournaments are, are uh, stand-up comedy and, mm -hmm. and rock musicians, right? Because you've got so many people who love doing it and they will do it for free, which is why you go out and you do these gigs for $50 
$10 in free beer every single night until you, you win, win the tournament. And it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing a similar trend in storytelling medium. And I think it's a great thing. Uh, and we've talked about this before. Michael Robertson of uh, MP3.com called it the, uh, the era of the, the rise of the middle class rock star, where all of a sudden you can, the, the distribution makes possible the ability for really talented individuals to get their story out at a, at a cost, you know, orders of magnitude less than conventional Hollywood. And Dana, when I read this story, it reminded me of something you'd said on our episode of Triangulation about how Ho Silicon Valley possibly taking some of what Hollywood does away. Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, what Brian says, though, uh, with the middle class rock star, whatever you call it, um, I, I come from two schools of thought. One that, that you, Tom, that I, I preached last time that you and I spoke, and but then the other school of thought, uh, and what is a worry for me with Silicon Valley is the quality of the content. Um, so, Brian, I'm sure if you go to you know places and you see bands and you see comedians, you'll see a lot more of those than you will, will see of great ones. Um, and the same thing will happen with, with uh, the content that starts coming into these pipelines. Um, so it's a it's a very exciting time, but it's sort of like you got to do the American Idol type <laughs> uh, filtering to find the best stuff out of the out of the chaff, I guess you would call it. Um, a lot of you know, if you see a lot of people on American Idol, they're all convinced they can sing. And I can tell you, having uh, done Trigger Street uh, Labs and for screenwriters and filmmakers, there's a lot of people that think that they're stories that they're telling you to be a short story or the short film or the screenplay is the best thing out there and they should be up at the academy awards accepting best picture um so it, I, you, you kind of have to split hairs with that of where this is going to go, go but it's an extremely exciting time and as i've said numerous times silicon valley really should start to take over hollywood and i see some of the stories that we're going to talk about uh, as far as google and and others getting into this business I personally think that they should really ramp it up and not just dip their toes in the water, should really just full bore go into it and start creating content rather than just relying on places and dabbling here and there. So one of the things that you notice with traditional media, even on even on cable television, where we just have this this pretty much there's more content on cable television than there's ever been in the history of, of, of TV. And but by and large, there is a certain base level of quality that it hits. I mean, you know, we, we all roll our eyes at the amount of crap on television, but by and large, there is a, a big difference between the worst programming on cable television versus the worst programming on YouTube, for yeah, example, sure. right? Uh, There's no floor on YouTube. Ex exactly. Yeah. Now, I, obviously, there are some channels, and I know that YouTube is trying to set up kind of a curated list of, like, these. this is where the good stuff is, but I'm fairly convinced that that's only going to be somewhat successful. I think the real success is going to be with the, the rise of, of the of, I don't mean to go all class warfare on this, but like like the curation class where all of a sudden there are personalities that you will follow. And we already see some of that with people judging the other content on YouTube. You got your Philip DeFranco's or any of these people who are talking about uh, your, uh, I forget the other guy. But, um, but how do you think it's going to break down in the future? Is Are we going to trust brand names and channels, or are we going to trust people more to guide us to the good stuff as, as more and more content comes available? I think it's going to be a combination of, of both. I mean, the, the good can rise to the top. The good quality and uh, the best content can rise to the top. Um, however, we're in this kind of quagmire right now where the traditional television and, and, and studios for films control the purse strings um, and Silicon Valley is reliant on that content. Um, and they, they kind of butt, butt heads quite often rather than, than dovetail. And so Silicon Valley, like YouTube and things like that, have to rely on some of the, uh, the crappier content, for lack of a better word, even like Netflix streaming. If you look, a lot of people complain that you, know, you don't get the best movies on there. And that's where, like, what we're doing with House of Cards is starting to flip that. And we're now going to be creating original content for Netflix. And it's not coming through the traditional sources as far as coming from a, a, a normal studio or a normal network. What they've done is they've hired all the creatives, uh, like myself and David Fincher and Kevin Spacey and people that are, you know, top of their game are very, very good at what they do. And they're bringing them in and saying, okay, look, you guys do what you do best. And then that's going to give us our content that we need uh, to start to uh, put into our, our pipeline. Now, 
I said this to you, Tom, last time I was up there, if Google wants to go and compete with Microsoft or Yahoo or whoever, whoever it is, they're going to go out and hire the best developers, the best designers, the, all the best people to do that. And I keep using Google as an example. Example, but all companies should take note on this. If they want to succeed at a certain aspect of their business, they go out and they hire the best that they that they can, or they bring in the best that they can. And frankly, Hollywood for the creative types like myself and the others that I mentioned are are very cheap and affordable in the grand scheme of things. Uh, when you, you talk about creating uh, new and original content at a, at a certain quality, um, so that's one end of the spectrum. But then you start to set the bar. Uh, where other people participating and be the guy in the backyard with the with a camera starts to see that well I got to step up my game and I can't just shoot this thing and it's, it may go viral or it may not but if I'm going to sustain and actually have a series I got to step up and then advertisers will start paying attention to things like House of Cards granted it's on Netflix but other avenues where they start to generate uh, original content and advertise there and realize a they they know better who they're reaching um, and even if it's a niche demographic like like you said, um, uh, uh, some of the television is crap, but if it's crap and it's still on, there's people watching it. Um, so that's all that matters. But if there's something that you like and there's a lot of people like you that like it, that's where the internet's a very exciting place because you don't have to have mass appeal. You can have a, a, a niche market that's extremely valued, valuable to an advertiser or to a sponsor, and then that's how that content can start to get paid for and generate uh, revenue. There's a tvguide.com uh, paid content survey that was just released uh, today saying 15% of people are watching six or more hours of online video per week. Now, compare that to 30-some plus hours of television a week, and it doesn't look that big, but it's a huge rise over 4% of people watching six or more hours of online video uh, a week. And 62% people surveyed said they were watching for more hours of online video than they were before. So this is to me it seems like we might be hitting the beginning of that hockey stick of watching video online and now begins the big scramble where you have the major networks saying well yeah we want to put some stuff out there but we're going to delay it eight days and and they're to me they're making all the mistakes that the music industry made before in trying to restrict how people use it and other people can move in and disrupt it and i think you end up maybe a few of the old school folks either fix it at the last minute or get it from the beginning and survive but we may be we may see a lot of these networks fall away if they don't catch on to this early and this is this is the time when they need to catch on to it well and that's the funny part because obviously the the rise in the ink or the increase in the amount of content people are watching online is good news but you got to realize that you're also educating the masses on you're normalizing this method of watching television and when you normalize this method of watching TV and then you call back seas and say okay you got to wait eight days so you will never get caught up with the television uh, version of it then all of a sudden you have somebody who's now literate and knows to watch has the experience of watching on their computer and all of a sudden it's very easy for them to say well I don't want to wait eight days I want to watch it right now and then all of a sudden you see I, I, I would be interested to see with the fluctuation of that or if they have a breakdown and how much of that is pirated material versus you know legal uh, Hulu etc well go, going on that for for a second and sorry I know I'm going on a bunch of different tan tangents and throwing a lot of uh, information and opinion um, at you guys did I lock up again am I frozen again yeah your video got you're doing a fantastic a ventriloquist act we are very impressed you just look very <laughs> serious yes no this is good whatever your point yeah. is it better be a serious point <laughs> well on, on that point though um, what I, and something I've said a lot too that, and it, we didn't learn from the record industry, my industry. And if we don't give the people what they want, how they want it, and when they want it, then we're going to go that way, and and they're just going to start to steal it. They're going to steal it no matter what. But if we can give people from the film side what they want, how they want, and when they want it, and everyone's building theaters within their house, TVs are getting bigger and bigger. You don't have to go and pay for a babysitter and uh, pay, you know the. 12, 15 bucks it is for a theater ticket and worry about somebody talking next to you or texting on their phone. More and more people want to stay at home. And there's actually was an interesting thing that I've been saying for quite a number of years of day and date releasing of the same type of theaters that it's it's out available for VOD. And we just recently did it. I, I didn't, but uh, Kevin Spacey, my business partner, is in a new movie called Margin Call. And it works particularly for a smaller independent movie like that. Because like if you take my father, my father lives in small town Virginia, but he has access to all the information, to all of the promotion and, 
and uh, Kevin and all the stars of the film going on Good Morning America and doing the usual circuit and talking about the film and reading about it in the paper and seeing the reviews. But when he goes out to his local theater, it's Transformers 3 or Puss in Boots or you know whatever the big movies are. He can't see a smaller film like that, although there's a demand for it. And Margin Call, it only opened in 15 markets, but it also released on iTunes and VOD on the same day. And they're talking about it now, and all these conference things are going on about what success it is. And what happens is it starts to snowball. It starts word of mouth. People start talking about it, and it doesn't just fade away. And a lot of people go to you know, see it on Margin Call, or see it on I see Margin Call on iTunes because they've read about it or they saw the, the cast and the stars on it. And while they can't see it in the theater, they can go onto iTunes or go onto uh, uh, Comcast or what other services is available and watch it right there in the comfort of their own home and rather than waiting for it. So it's it's money that the distributors and the studios and networks in some cases are leaving on the table. It's money they could get now that are leaving on the table. And frankly, I think a lot more of uh, copies of Margin Call would have been stolen if it wasn't made available for people to easily just download. Yeah, that's one of the things. A lot of people think that uh, piracy is about stuff getting stuff for free. But if you think about it, uh, you spend a lot of money to pirate stuff. Whether you know, if you get yourself a, uh, you know, you, we'll say if you're not going to do the torrent thing, you're paying for the uh, for for the service itself. You pay for like a, a news bin uh, account for for the news groups. You pay for the uh, uh, for the software to parse it all. Or there's even services that'll that'll. Uh, Break it all down for you. So it's clearly, I mean, uh, if, if you tally it up, there you are pay people, for the electricity to run your computer for six days well, while it's downloading <laughs> exactly. the torrent. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and, and of course, and, and of course, the bandwidth costs as well because you also have the very high expense of downloading several copies of it because some might be corrupted or or passworded or <laughs> or, or, or trojan or whatever. Um, so so clearly, it's it's not just about getting it for free. I'm, although I'm sure there's a segment of the piracy sure. network that is that, but I think it's much much <laughs> more about people wanting it and wanting it now. And, uh, yeah, and going it, wherever it, they it, have to get it. Go on, you can go on iTunes now, and it's like seven bucks or whatever it is. I'm not going to search around the internet and and wait and try to download it. As you said, Brian, that it's you know you might get a bad copy, and then you got to download it again, or maybe it's a, a you know you finally get a full copy, and then you're going through, and then it's you know 45 minutes in, it cuts off, or there's a guy stands up in the middle of the of the yeah. of the shot. Yeah, I would much rather know that I have. The thing I'm going to enjoy when it's two hours of my time that I'm going to have a good quality of it, and I'll pay seven bucks for that. But if you don't, I you know, look, I understand why people pirate. If they can't get it, then then they're going to get it. If they can't get it legitimately, they're going to get it illegitimately. All right, that brings us to talking about what people actually are going to watch these things on, which is yet another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. CNN has a report on Strategy Analytics Survey, which says 12% of U.S. households use game platforms to watch online movies, TV shows, or videos more than the percentage that connect PCs to TVs by HDMI. Now, PCs still lead the way for online video, but that's usually in your den, watching it on your monitor. As far as watching it actually on your TV, game consoles are starting to become the box yeah, and I that have, we've been talking about. I have to wonder if, if some amount of this is... I, I wonder how they break it down. Is this all by survey, or is they, they're actually watching where the traffic goes based on which device? Because, for example, I use, I use um, uh, I can't remember if it's Play On or On Live. On Live is the video game one. Play On is the one I use. So it's like, it's Play I'm, On. I'm watching Apply it. directly to the forehead. Exactly. <laughs> I, I use Play On on my Xbox, so it's, it's technically going from my PC. So if they're just watching traffic, that'll show up as me watching it mm. on my PC, not on the Xbox, but I'm watching it on my console in the living room. Yeah, the uh, the upcoming Xbox TV launch, uh, they say, will demonstrate an expansion of the partnership between games consoles and online TV. That's the thing where Microsoft is actually going to give you access to some of your cable television through the Xbox. So that if you have your Xbox in a den, for instance, you wouldn't have to have a cable box down there. You could watch a lot of your, your cable television just through the Xbox. And I think it's Microsoft, we've talked about this a lot, trying to kind of be a Trojan horse that says, sure, we'll, we'll bring you live TV channels. You'll still have to keep your cable subscription for a while. Right. But maybe eventually we'll be able to provide you those live cable channels directly uh, through here. I mean, I think the game consoles are in position to be the thing that people use to watch internet video. The question is, are they going to put their cable television through there? Is that necessary? Is that a big advantage? Uh, or 
should distributors be looking at Microsoft and Sony and possibly Nintendo as another Netflix, another Hulu, another place to push your content out to? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'll tell you, when I think of what I'm most excited about with consoles, I think about the, the UI experience because, uh, you know, I, I tried to add, I finally, we'll talk about this later, but uh, uh, I decided, I'm like, it's ridiculous that I don't have It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia set up on my DVR, and it took five full minutes of scrolling through uh, stupid screen after stupid sl screen with a slow, outdated UI to finally find it and then select it on the right channel and the right resolution. At the, That's at why the with right DirecTV, I just, I just use the iPad app to... to to record shows now because I can use a search box instead of doing what you're talking about. Exactly, exactly. Well, and, and uh, I'll tell you, man, it's uh, uh, the cable companies better realize the benefit that we get out of the uh, out of the superior user interface that we have. And, and I know I think that the movements that they're making are in the wrong direction. Stuff like the Time Warner I watch watch video on your iPad app. That's that's not really what we want. We want to use the iPad, but we want to make it our uh, to to have a superior viewing experience, not on the device, but using the, devi the device to control it, at least for me. Dana, what do, what do you think of this idea of the game console sort of becoming the, the bottleneck through which all the content has to pass? Well, I think that it's inevitable uh, when that happens, but I, I frankly, I think the next console is this. It's, it's your iPhone. And Just with this AirPlay? Is your, it's, yeah, I think with AirPlay with this and the iPad as well, where this will be your service and it'll be an app that you download your direct TV app and then it, it pulls it in through your pipes or you have your Comcast app or what, or actually your Netflix app and your other streaming services apps. And the same thing, and I think this becomes your game console as well, that your games are actually on this and then it becomes your controller and the or the iPad works in conjunction with it. Um, the direct TV app is amazing. Uh, I love that thing, and that's that's my new remote in a lot of ways. I oh, wish yeah, it didn't too. control my lights and things, and I'll probably get one <laughs> of the, the other apps that do that, but then you got to jump from one to the next. The only problem I have with that is I like you know browsing the web and doing email and things like that. I wish it kind of had like an overlay or something like that. Um, and it's also kind of cool that, I don't know if you've seen it, but in the new update allows live streaming on uh, DirecTV now as well. So as I'm browsing through channels, if my girlfriend's watching something, um, and before I change the channel, I can kind of check things out and see where they are. So if it's on a commercial or something like that, you can sit there and browse through and then actually watch the channel on your iPad app while you have the other show up on your television before you actually change the, the channel. So I, I use it more for preview than, than actually watching it. But um, I think Brian's right. The cable companies really need to watch out. Um, and with Time Warner, I think what they did uh, with their app was cool at first, uh, but they need to take it another step. They need to make it so I can have my iPad or my iPhone here. They need to copy what Netflix is doing and saying, okay, that's connected to your device and, and kind of like Slingbox, because I can get a Slingbox app and do that now. Why not just let the app give me my service wherever I'm at and yeah. let me watch it uh, when, when and where I want to watch it. Now, now we've talked about this a lot in the past, and I'd be interested to get your take. Uh, one, one of the theories that we had is like they know this is coming. They know that they're going to have to adapt. But what they're trying to do with a lot of this fussing is is buying time, giving them enough uh, time to figure out how they're going to adjust to the new dynamic. Do you think it's a case where they really are just just this resistant and slow, or is this a case where they're doing a bit of gamesmanship to buy themselves enough time to figure out how they're going to make money in the long term? I think it's a combination of both, and therein lies the problem. I think it's a lot of the old garden, di garden dinosaurs that are in, in, in my business, and it, it's it's going to be somebody else's problem. We saw that happen with the, with the record industry, and so you know they've only got a few more years left, and so they're not going to have to deal with it. I think there's other people that that are uh, a little bit pro more proactive and tech savvy and understand where the business is going, and they're butting up against uh, uh, the old guard, and so it's making it it's it's getting done but getting done begrudgingly and in the meantime we're losing ground in this industry when we could be on the forefront of it and and you know way out ahead of 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 a lot i mean the fact that we only have that that i know of two decent at one one is the time warner which i don't have time warner so i don't i haven't really experienced it but direct tv i mean your ipad should be covered literally covered with shit you could watch um, and or, or you know control and interact with all of your different uh, devices, be it your your DVR or your television and, and wherever you go. But we're just we're just not there. 
Yeah, we're lagging behind the capability. Uh, we got another entrant into the uh, the cable television game. We'll talk about that in a second. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Ford, featuring voice activated sync app link, enabling you to control select apps from your smartphone. We're talking about all these apps that we use to control our TV. Uh, you can control apps while you're driving your car, keeping your eyes on the road, your hands on the wheel, and just talking to your Ford Fiesta or your other Ford with Sync app link. You can, you can have your Twitter feed read to you, Brian. Uh, that's good because I'm too lazy to read nowadays, especially yeah. while I'm driving. You shouldn't be reading while you're driving. Well, I mean, unless they're road it signs that clearly Twitter. indicate danger ahead. Was it, that? It'll read Twitter feed to you? Yeah, there's, a, there's an app called <laughs> Open, Open Beak. Uh, that is integrated into AppLink. So while you're driving, you can say, read my app replies, or read my timeline, and it'll just read off all the stuff. You know what? And actually, have. I'm really glad to hear that because that is one of those, uh, that's one of those things like that I'm guilty of wanting to just sneak a little peek. I was like, well, I tweeted right before I got on the road. Yeah. What are people saying? But yeah. then it's like if it'll read you the app Much replies, safer to do it this life. way. Uh, and, and much wiser, at least, to keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel. Also, Pandora, one of the, another one of the apps. You could even uh, you can thumbs up, thumbs down things on Pandora while you're driving. You can also uh, actually create a channel. Uh, just just talk it. Just just give with your voice. All that stuff comes from AppLink, and they're working with uh, an API platform that they have for developers to make all kinds of apps that take advantage of this. So check it out on the 2012 Ford Fiesta and learn more about it at Ford's website, ford.com slash technology. We thank them for their support of Frame Rate. Time now for yet another big story. In your bootstraps, it's yet another big story. I like that one because it's got the dancing girls in it. Yeah. That one makes me happy. That, that, well, because at this point, third big story, you need something. <laughs> you got to yeah. zazz it up a little you bit. You got to bring, <laughs> bring the fun. Uh, Google might offer TV and phone service over its fiber network in Kansas City. Uh, we know that they're building out a, a, a one gigabit per second network in Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri, the whole municipal area. Uh, but there's talk, according to Engadget, that they're considering doing a bundle. So they've been going around and talking to the different uh, channel operators, Disney, Time Warner, Discovery, those kinds of people, and saying, hey, what would it take for you to allow us to deliver cable over our internet uh, as a service, just the way Verizon Fios does it. And then they already have Google Voice. It'd be easy enough to, to bundle in a telephone service. And then you'd have a real competitor to cable companies this now, way. Uh, so is this, uh, now, in this case, obviously, Google is laying down a completely new infrastructure with the fiber, right? So obviously, this applies to this city. But in order for this same service to go everywhere else, they would have to lay fiber in every single city that they brought Yeah, I mean, to. we're far from Google even talking about becoming an ISP. They're doing this as an experiment. Uh, Good. to see if it can be done, how it can be done, how cheaply it can be done. And I guess th as part of the experiment, they're looking at it and saying, well, what if we do the whole ball of wax? We could learn all kinds of things. And then when we're trying to get the cable companies to come onto Google TV and they say, well, you can't do that because the cable, cable business doesn't work that right, way. Well, they could say, well, we run a cable yeah, business exactly. in Kansas City. Uh, I am 100% pro-disruption across the board. I am, I am in favor of whatever will shake things up, uh, especially when it comes to, to this kind of thing. So go Google. Experiment with your bad self. Do you think this is a, a likely, likely story here, Dana? Yeah, if Google did that, that would be a game changer. Uh, unfortunately, it's only in Kansas City. It would be uh, amazing to see them be able to do it everywhere because it would it would completely disrupt what we all know from from the look. Everyone has problems with their cable company. I think everyone has bigger problems with their phone companies. So if Google got in that game. That would, as far as uh, um, with your, your local home service and utilizing Google Voice and just how amazing that is. Uh, yeah, it'd be a game changer and. I'd love to see it. I, I don't. I don't think that I uh, am excited about Google being a service provider. They're not great on the customer service oh side. Oh my gosh! No, but, notoriously like hostile. Have you ever tried to actually call Google for anything? Just have. Just having another competitor would be would be enough. Yeah. No. But you know what? Here's the thing, though. With Google, though, there's there'd be tons of forums and tons of ways to figure it out yourself. And they're, they're very good about you know setting things up and letting people figure it out. And you guys are totally right. Anytime like I have issues with my business apps or things like that, it's like good luck trying to contact. It's like how PayPal used to be. If you used to have an issue, there was no there's no way to contact them. But uh, I think that would change obviously for uh, if they were to do a local infrastructure in a city like Kansas. Um, but uh, I think there would be a lot more support and hacking type things going on uh, to, to help the customer base. And on the, on the other side, Google TV users are getting an adult video channel. Yeah, so what's the story with this? 
Uh, it's Vivid. It's a, a, a website, and uh, this is an HTML5 app, so you don't actually have to download it. it just, it's just going to come with the new Google TV interface. And, <laughs> what? Why are you laughing? Uh, that's, that's, was, that's, was, that's what you get off the new uh, Google TV interface is, is uh, the Vivid uh, app. So, you know, something for all ages. Well, not all ages. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm saying there's something on Google TV for all ages. <laughs> Because there, oh. there, there's, there's, you know, there's kids apps there, but now there's something for the adults as well. <laughs> but look, it's so good right now. Yeah, uh, the thing that drove technology in a lot of ways. So yeah, um, they've actually been falling behind considerably uh, in the last few years. Ironic, I'm, I'm, I live in LA, so obviously I uh, run into a few porn stars here and there. Uh, and uh, a good friend of mine is uh, Caden Cross, who's a porn star, and she's in uh, somewhere overseas right now shooting a film, a, a proper feature film, not a uh, not one of her her type. Anyways, she, she sent me, it was funny, because I got an email from her this morning that said, um, somebody gave me a hard drive today, and it loaded with movies and said, here, here's a, here's a hard drive full of movies. And she said, uh, your movie, The Social Network, was on there. And uh, she's like, but you know what really pissed me off? Two of my movies were on there as well. And so she felt aligned with me for the first time. That <laughs> She was completely fine with my movie being on there and stolen, but when she saw two of her movies on there, she got pissed off about it. Made a big difference. Of yeah. course, yeah. <laughs> but right. the, with the, with the, can, let me talk for the sure. Google thing for a second, though. That it's going to be interesting to see how that starts to play out, though, because uh, um, th they're having a difficult time, and it's going to be interesting to see if, like, if Samsung starts to allow like the Vivid Chicklet or the Digital Playground Chicklet um, and allow... Uh, users to to download and how uh, into the uh, um, the user interface of, of their television and I'm just curious how long they're going to be a, be kept out so it's 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 interesting to see Google is starting to allow that because once they do it that starts to open the floodgates of, of the others are going to start to have to do that as well because a lot of people you know a lot of the problems with the iPad and the iPhone was that they couldn't get porn on it and look laugh you know laugh about it but Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, por porn has always been the deciding factor. It, it, it crowned uh, VHS over Betamax. It crowned Blu-ray right. over HD DVD. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is I mean, in, in many ways, this is the coronation of... Of Google the, TV? Yeah, is exactly. Totally. Yeah, I think wow, so. All right. so look, oh, I think this, and a lot of people talk about the Android device, too, because that you can, you can get porn on it. Now, obviously, the porn sites are starting to adapt, so they work on... I don't, don't ask me how I know this, uh, but they work on... The <laughs> I'm told. And, iPhone, but um, correspondence. That, that's a smart move on Google's part, though, because it's it's going to it will definitely bring more people to Google TV. The fact that they know that they can start getting that there. Granted, they could just go into the web browser and get it that way as well. And just yeah, go sure. Screen. But uh, um, it's 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 definitely I think going to work to their favor. Let's move on to Film Found. Andy Serkis has got more work. Fox has signed him for a sequel to Apes, uh, and uh, there's a campaign going for uh, pushing for an Oscar nod. For I was so stoked when I saw this because I think that was the surprise best movie the entire summer for me anyway was uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And uh, the thing that really stuck out for me on this is that there was an announcement, and I don't know how you announce that you're going to push for someone to get an Oscar recognition, but they were saying that they we want to push really hard for Andy Serkis to get the credit uh, that he's due when it comes to the Academy or Awards, Does that just mean more of those mailings, more of those ads for your consideration, that kind of thing? I think that is their push, them announcing that they're going to push for it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no, but they, they will definitely, uh, you know, there will be a variety in Hollywood Reporter. I'm sure there'll be full-page ads for that. Um, and then they send out the DVDs to the Academy members and to all to all the voters. Uh, honestly, my, my opinion, I don't think it'll happen. Well, um, and specifically, but, uh, I, that, this is what I wanted to ask you because you've got the insider sauce. Uh, I... I suspect there's a strong anti-digital actor bias among the Academy. That's part of the reason that, you know, we hear that uh, that Avatar got snubbed is because uh, actors don't want to perceive themselves as replaceable commodities, that they want to believe that they're bringing their own unique life into the character. They don't want to think that they can distill acting down to a science that could be done by a bunch of eggheads in cubicles. Um, and I, I suspect yeah, there'll be a backlash against Andy Serkis uh, for that very same reason. I, I think you're right, and and both from from SAG because that's a big voting body as well, and a lot of, of actors will feel like they're going to start to be replaced. Imagine if if, if you had a how that could write screenplays, uh, 
no writer is going to vote for for it's it's kind of like if if uh, people that worked in the auto industry could vote against robots uh, that were ultimately going to take their jobs, then they would. The other school of thought is uh, it's it, it allow you still have to be a decent actor and a good actor even even if you're going to get your face uh, replaced. Um, but it's it may be even even a better actor, but um, most don't realize that. Um, uh, and so I I don't think it's going to play, particularly with the the academy. Uh, voting body being of a much older generation, I don't think that that will happen. Peter Jackson's been doing some great work of putting up videos of behind the scenes. His recent one shows off a lot of the tech that they're using on filming The Hobbit. Uh, no less than 48 red epic cameras at 48 frames per second, full 5K resolution. Uh, but if that sounds awesome to you, he talks about a lot of the troubles with doing this. When you're shooting in 3D, two 3D cameras need to be mounted at the interocular level, so about the same distance between your eyes, and that's impossible given the size of the Epic and its lenses. So they hired a specialist called 3Ality to build a rig where one camera shoots the action and the other is pointed vertically at a mirror. Uh, and he shows all of those red cameras, shows off uh, how they did it in this video. Just great access uh, and good on Peter Jackson for pr providing that kind of documentation of what he's doing as he goes along. So let me ask, and again, I want to poke uh, Dana on this because, you know, he's got the inside sauce on it. Uh, is, is there some kind of trepidation that there is? Because as long as you're using film, you're using an analog source that can forever be upscaled or rescanned or, or uh, you know, it's, it's as precise as you could possibly get. Whereas something like with the Red Epic, are we going to laugh at how low resolution, low quality, low frame rate the captures are 50 years from now? And, and is a case where where we're going to wish that we had uh, more analog sources at this ten years, at this decade of content that we're creating. No, some of the old school cinematographers, they'll you know they, they still continue to swear by uh, film, but uh, more and more it's 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 going digital because they see just what you're what you're capable of doing that you're incapable of doing with uh, with film. Um, it, uh, Twenty-one, we shot digital. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize that. You may not realize we shot uh, the social network. We shot that with the red camera, um, and so the, you're losing that that look and what they want to get and what you're talking about the upscale and all that. It's what you can. It, the way you shoot digital and then just what you can do with it in post, you can never do with film. And so I think we've crossed that that uh, uh, where film is better, where digital is just it's so much it's so much more capable. I mean, can you go down to the store and buy a, a, a 35 millimeter uh, steel camera now, or is it loaded down, is, the, is your camera store loaded down with all digital cameras? This industry is on the same way. And finally, uh, Netflix has secured a multi-year MGM streaming deal for the UK. So there you go, UK <laughs> listeners, who are always complaining that all our Netflix coverage is only about the United States. Uh, you got exclusive <laughs> rights over new MGM films coming to the UK. T tomorrow, the newspaper headlines say, Merit to Britain. Shut up, whiners. <laughs> you got MGM. <laughs> Stiff upper lip. <laughs> now shut up. Let's check in on the NSFW show frame rate movie draft. So Justin Robert Young still leading the way with 109 million after Tower Heist and a very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas. Didn't I, I, do you want to call it disappointing? It's not really well, disappointing. Well, yeah, because they, you didn't, didn't expect much from yeah, either they, of them. They didn't do enough to to push. Uh, their owner, Glenn Rubenstein, who had Tower Heist. They, 25 million, actually, is about right where I thought it would be. So it, yes. it should have done exactly what he expected. But again, look at the prices that they paid relative to the first round. Because again, the, the voting for this one was a little bit weird because we had so few movies and so many players. A lot of people were concerned about not even getting enough movies with their money. And in fact, three people went home with, uh, with too much money left over in their pockets. Uh, so I understand why these movies would go for $17 a pop. But, uh, but I'll tell you what, man, I, I think that Paranormal Activity 3 for $16 it's already grossed $95 million. that's going to be the one to beat and it may be what gives Justin his very first not first place finish. Puss in Boots is not doing you uh, bad either. You, no, you're it's, right on it Justin held on to at $101 million, and Puss in Boots did $77 million. Yeah, and, well it had a uh, relatively disappointing opening weekend compared to what the Shrek franchise had been doing but the fact that it's continuing to make money week over week is pretty good. I don't know if this will be the end of it this week. Oh, but of course this week we got uh, Immortals and Jack and Jill. I'm going to be very sad if Immortals doesn't bring home plenty of bacon for me. So what do you think, Dana? Is, uh, is Immortals going to treat Brian Wright this weekend? 
What's your, what's your... Oh, no! Don't your, give me that look, Dana! What's your best Tell me it's going to be the best thing since Clash of the Titans. Come on! <laughs> since Clash of the Titans? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to laugh. Oh, boo. Well, I, I love uh, green screens. I haven't looked at the tracking. I could probably tell you exactly what I was going to do um, if I looked at the tracking. I didn't look at the tracking this week. We have a, in, in our business, you guys may or may not know about this, but where they track films, where it's almost like they poll kind of like with uh, politics, where they call around and they basically do un unaided awareness or aided awareness and whether or not people want to see a film or not. And pretty much three or four weeks out, they can see how a film is tracking. And they usually call the number and call it pretty accurate from the Thursday that we go, even before they go in, whether or not it's going to be, uh, the, before we go into the week, whether or not the film is going to be number one or not. And then once we go into the weekend, by Thursday numbers, they usually know and predict pretty accurately what the box office is going to be come Sunday. That's why there's usually a lot of, uh, you'll see a lot of headlines when one surprises because it kind of pops out of, of the tracking or uh, if they call a number too soon and then one or two are fighting for uh, uh, what was actually number one, because that really matters if it's number one or not. So uh, I didn't look at the tracking on this, but I can take a look and get back to you and tell you what it's going to be. <laughs> you can send me a laughogram early on this on how bad I'm screwed. Well, I mean, my, I, frankly, I haven't, I haven't looked. I could be completely wrong, but um, the advertise, they are, they're advertising the hell out of it, so that, that tends to make a difference. I uh, I just I, I'm not on the board yet because I still got two weeks to go before Twilight comes in and shoots me in a number one. Oh my gosh, that will be amazing! How much gonna is be so dropping? Did. <laughs> Say that again, Dana. I think this is going to skyrocket and just be so stupid and ridiculous. I can't stand. It. I have friends in that <laughs> franchise as well, and it just drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah, I did, no, I, and I had to explain to people when we were doing the draft, like, no, no, this is not what I think my favorite movie of the fall yes. is. <laughs> this is the one I think is going to make bank. That's why. Yeah, I, no, I, I didn't know about this draft until I saw you guys the last time I was up there, and I was like, what the hell does Tom think? <laughs> no, yeah, I had to say has worked and you're a wise man thank you thank you all right let's take a, uh, a quick break and thank squarespace uh, for helping to bring us frame rate squarespace.com fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog you can do it before i'm done telling you about squarespace if you just go to squarespace.com that's how easy it is and it's absolutely absolutely free you don't have to use a credit card or anything to sign up you just press that get started button put in a site name write up a post you you can even even have time to tweak around in the layouts and and figure out what colors you want what kind of layout you want it's all right there they have an iphone ipad android app so you can update your blog on the go online resources and a special support team if you do run into something you're like i can't quite figure out how to do this one crazy thing that i thought of Call them up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They can give you personal help. Uh, they also do importing of your old blog, and they believe in data portability, so all your data can be taken with you if you decide to move on at some point. So check them out, squarespace.com. Uh, you can get 20% off for six months if you do decide to pay for the service, but you don't need to pay at all uh, to try it out. No credit card needed. But if you do decide to pay, remember this, this phrase, Brian, frame rate 11. Frame rate 11. That is what you need to remember. Just picture a line of kings, each named frame rate, and the 11th of his name. Yeah. It's frame rate 11. Frame rate 11, squarespace.com. We thank him for their support. <laughs> What's that, Dana? So Brian just made it more confusing. I, I, have, frame, I have that talent. That's Every, my little skill, Dana. Everyone's going to be writing frame rate X Y. <laughs> X or, please don't. don't do By the way, if you go to recordsetter.com, the uh, world record for fastest website registration is on a Squarespace. Just type in Squarespace at Record Setter, and you can see that uh, the world record for fastest registration of a re website is 25 seconds by Aaron Ryder. So you can take him down if you want. Take down Aaron Ryder, squarespace.com, frame rate 11. Let's move on to Tube Top. So Google, an internet company, is trying to use their internet to bring you a cable service, while Dish, a satellite company, is trying to use, I don't know whose internet, to bring you television channels over the internet. What is with this weird, incestuous, uh, everybody getting together with everybody? Everybody wants everyone else's backyard. Yeah, so they've approached several uh, TV channels, according to All Things D, uh, for use on a new pay TV service to be delivered over the Internet rather than over their satellite system. Uh, offering the channels could give Dish more flexibility to exclude channels. 
So this is all about the lineup. Oh, you think this is a workaround of, about existing agreements that they have? Yeah, because the way the way the cable television industry works, if you're ESPN, uh, if you want to get ESPN, which every cable service does, you got to take ESPN do too. You got to take ESPN Classic. You know, they use that leverage to force those extra channels on, which is why you see all those weird channels up in the 300s and 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 200s. Uh, and this would give them some more flexibility because they wouldn't be under existing contracts that they've signed. Now, I'll tell you, this actually makes sense to me in that same way that using uh, Sirius or XM, if you're a Sirius XM subscriber, you don't, you shouldn't have to get your signal just off of their satellites. You should be able to get it on your computer, and they started offering that. Um, and it makes sense if they have a particular subscriber base that they could take it and convert it into users on a different platform. Um, this would not include sports channels, according to the All Things D article. It was a Wall Street Journal article that they're reporting. So, I mean, are, are they aiming to be the next Hulu? The next. I, you know, but this is live TV. I think they're aiming to be the first film on, like, legitimate. We're going to deliver television channels to you over the Appointment internet. Appointment viewing, yeah. yeah. Dana, are any cable, are any uh, television channels going to sign up for this? I mean, they trust Dish and, and they want to have a good relationship with Dish, but it seems like everybody's resisting deliver their, delivering their channel directly over the internet. I think they worry about pissing off the other uh, the the others that that carry their channel. So that's that's where the the battle is going to. So lie if they make that. this deal with Dish, then they could potentially ruin their relationship with, say, Comcast. Correct. But I think it is where uh, if like if you look at Planet Green, which used to be one of my favorite favorite channels, or even old, old Tech TV, uh, it was a, a favorite favorite channel of mine. Uh, if and then what you guys have done with, with Twit and what Leo has done, that's where things like this could then go. So if, if something is, is, is not going to last at uh, whatever, at Comcast or Time Warner or wherever, whoever's picking it up, then Dish could pick it up and they actually could start to build a, a decent network um, and stream it through. I don't think this is the future, though. I think the future is is the chicklets on the TV and, and what Netflix is doing and even what Vivid is doing with, with uh, Android, as funny as it may sound. But I think that that's where it's, it's really all going to go. I think this is something that might be interesting and it might be a, a second tier where channels can go to die um, or, or before they turn into uh, a chicklet on, a, on a, a TV interface or on the iPad app. CBS's Les Moonves has been known to uh, let some things slip during earnings calls, and there was no exception in the last CBS earnings calls. He was talking about uh, revenue splits. CBS has been very insistent about not enjoining things like Hulu because it's a revenue split, and they just want to get paid up front for their content. He said, we frankly, we don't believe in them. We're not going to go out, and we've sort of, we've even been against joining Apple TV, which was an advertiser split. And these deals are, and he kept going, and everyone stopped listening because they're like, what did you just say? Did right. you say that Apple TV was trying to propose a revenue split? And that's why CBS didn't join it, and that's why nobody else joined it, because they didn't like the revenue split, because it was probably 30-70, like everything that Apple does. I mean, <laughs> it, it caused a lot of waves in the industry. Uh, well, and so w what does this necessarily change for, for, for someone like me who doesn't necessarily I, – I don't get into to the CEO boss talk. Uh, All it means is that that suspicion you had that there was an Apple TV service being negotiated was right. probably true. Okay, good. Is that, is, is that right? Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think that's all well, this means. Here, with, the, with the advertiser split, though, I mean, that's the advertiser split of what? Because everybody is fast forwards through now or downloads it or gets it on iTunes. And the advertiser split is, I think, is going to get smaller and smaller and it's got to go to something like Apple TV. And, you know, again, it goes back to give the users what they want, when they want, and how they want it. Yeah. Uh, so they really have to figure out if Apple TV was able to bring in advertisers and say, look, we have these advertisers that you're losing and we have we figured out a way of bringing that revenue in. I think that's where you're going to get guys like Les Moonves. Granted, he's, you know, he's like one of the ones that I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's that's it's a big problem for the for the networks is advertising and, and they're losing it like crazy. And rather than fighting Apple, they, again, they need to take a note from the record industry. The record industry didn't want to do that split either, and it's not the best split, but it's better than everyone still on your music. Yeah. Well, and also keep in mind that part of what made the record in industry survive is is discovering new sources of revenue. You know, by deciding that okay, we're not making as much money on album sales, but now we have this whole ringtones uh, subscription service, and uh, I, I don't know what the equivalent will be for digital video, but I gotta suspect there's all kinds of different uh, un untapped markets for making 
less money at a time, but more revenue total. Something that yep. tech companies, oh, go ahead, Dana. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about margin call. You just have to rethink about how you distribute it and how you get your how you get it out there. And rather than making big, you know, movies as we all know gets made in my business for the masses, make them for the niche. But then also, it's you have to pay attention to, um, uh, you know, again how it gets distributed. Doing margin call, put it on iTunes, doing day and day re releasing. And the smart people in my business, they, they're starting to term a uh, new term called the fifth quadrant. Everyone's always talking about the four quadrants, uh -huh. which is you know, older male, younger male, older female, younger female. Well, the fifth quadrant is, and I just discovered this a couple of weeks ago, it's the people that don't go to the theaters or the people that don't watch it the normal way. They watch it on their iPhone or they watch it on their iPad or they watch it on their computer. Um, that's the fifth quadrant. And that's where, what they're talking about here, that's a quadrant that they're leaving out. That fifth quadrant, if they don't wanna go and participate in something like uh, Apple TV or Hulu or Google TV, then they start to leave money on the table, in, in my opinion. That's uh, that's our audience, the fifth quadrant. Yeah, right absolutely. Here. Yeah, you're, you're talking yeah, to them right now. That's interesting. Uh, everybody keeps trying to give us this, but I'm not sure anybody wants it. Uh, Yahoo's got a new update to their app, Into Now, which is interactive TV on your on your your iPad. So the idea is, while you're watching TV, it uses some pretty cool technology and voice recognition to tell what you're watching, uh, and then it can display relevant information related to that show. Things like Twitter streams of anybody talking about the show at the time. So even if you're watching on your DVR later, you can catch people watching it around that same time. Uh, through the Twitter stream, they put Wikipedia articles about the actors up, stuff like that. So, so the question, of course, is, is this going to be Flipboard, where Flipboard takes uh, random content and aggregates it in a gorgeous way that gives you a magazine, almost a curated-like experience, or is it going to be just an annoying thing like, they mentioned muffins, here's coupons for muffins, you yeah. know, they, they, here's a picture of a dinosaur, because we think we heard a dinosaur in the background. I tried it the other day, and, and frankly, you know, the one thing I thought was useful for uh, was the idea of seeing somebody on and saying, oh, wow, I know them from some other uh, thing. And then I could get to their Wikipedia article really quickly. Uh, I wish I could get to IMDb, actually, instead of Wikipedia. But I could get to it really quickly and say, oh, okay, they were in this, this movie or this TV show. That's where I recognize them from. Other than that, I didn't really care about what other people it, were saying it, it on Twitter. It could be a good idea. Maybe it's a case where the technology is just too uh, embryonic for it to work the way that we imagine it should. It could go. It could go really well. It could go really bad. There's some cool ways of use, using this, but a lot of annoying ways of using it. Um, like some of the cooler ways if you do it, like if, if, if Game of Thrones. If you're while you're watching Game of Thrones, I don't know if you guys watch it or not, but oh yeah, you know, it's, it's a very complicated uh, uh, show. And it's I didn't read the books. I'm watching the show. I'm like, wait, who's that guy? What's that guy? And it, so if there was something on an iPad that had like the map and interactive map, that like this guy and this is yeah, that's his sister, and they're screwing each other, and that's why that's weird. And that you know, if you kind of configure that all out on an iPad app while you're watching it, something like that makes sense. Otherwise, if 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 I'm watching Breaking Bad or watching one of you know Walking Dead or something like that, and it's just popping up like. Uh, 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 Wikipedia type things, that link, and that, that's more of a distraction to me than anything. The Twitter feed, I mean, my friends, we all tend to watch the same uh, thing, so I'm just on Twitter and tweeting about you know whatever I'm watching with them as it as it's going on. But the problem with that is it ends up then being spoiler alerts for all my other uh, 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 followers. So it's it could be a uh, um, it could be very cool if used for the right shows. But overall, I think it's going to be more of a distraction uh, for the really good shows. I wanted to have maps. Like when I was watching The Wire, I was constantly on Google Maps. Oh, really? Trying to, to figure out what part of the city corners? they, yeah, where yeah. the corners See, that, were, all that's that a, stuff. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Motorola Mobility uh, has been talking about Android-based cable boxes, and The Verge has a story about one called the Corvair, which comes with a, a sort of a tablet. It's like an Android tablet as part of the cable box so that you'd be able to not only use it as a remote, but also show some of the content on the tablet. It's similar to what DirecTV is doing that you were talking about earlier, Dana, uh, where you can see uh, some of the, the content that you're getting over your cable box on the tablet as a preview or as a second screen. Uh, it's a dedicated controller, though, so it's not an actual tablet. It's just the remote control that comes with the box. I think it's a cool step in the right direction. I mean, of course, you never know until you get hands-on with it. Did they announce a price point for this? No, this is all still concept stuff. $99. And, yeah. You yeah. heard it here first. There you go. Well, you know what? And it's going to come with your cable subscription. I think this is because Motorola makes a lot of those kind of boxes. 
So, Dude, if they could do anything to improve the default UI experience, it, it is so universally miserable. I have not. I wish I could awful. go back to my awful. 1999 TiVo. Yeah, no, it's 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 so bad that the fact that something like this hasn't come out earlier is 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 insane. The best remote that I I think it's out there right now. I mean, unless you go with like you know a ten thousand dollars system like a Crestron, and even those have become a bit dated. But it is the Harmony remote? But yes. even you look at that, and it's like. What, th this thing could do so much more. So it, that that market is just begging for uh, a, a company to come in and just dominate it. And whether that's it or not, it, it'd be interesting to see. And finally, Myth TV. It's a uh, DVR, Dude, uh, open source heard DVR about Myth forever. box. It, it <laughs> runs best on Linux. There is a, been a Windows version, but it was very limited compared to the Linux box. So a lot of people didn't want to use it because they didn't want to blow out a box. They had a Windows box and they didn't want to. They didn't want to put Linux on it. Well, a bunch of developers have ported. Uh, the interface from the Linux version of Myth TV to Windows. So now with your Microsoft Home Theater p PC, you can get live TV, commercial skipping, DVR, all the stuff that Myth TV is famous for now on the Windows interface. That is fantastic. Yeah, just a little, little handy note there. Shall we go into what we're watching? And uh, Brian. <laughs> Oh, well, good. We did get the variety. Oh, we got a new one. Oh, right okay. on. <laughs> what are you watching? Uh, so you're watching Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Uh, no, it's like not only am I getting back on it because I had like four episodes built up and I just watched them straight through. I am so deeply in love with that show. You never got into it, did you? I, I've watched a couple episodes, but Eileen got so far ahead of me that I, I haven't caught up. Oh, my so God. Like it's, I've got enough. it so bad now that I've, I haven't done this in years. I watched full-on reruns on Comedy Central, watched live television just because I wanted more Always Sunny in, in Philadelphia. Wow. I freaking love that show. You love that show. And, of course, uh, uh, Walking Dead. I don't know. Oh, and, and Fringe. I, I had an epiphany about Fringe because I'm, I'm plowing through the second season, uh, and I'm realizing there are certain episodes I'll just breeze right through and, and queue up the next one, and then other ones that I'll spend, like, days that will watch five minutes and then get distracted and come back, and I'm really realizing that there's something about me that's hardwired to hate the Monster of the Week episodes. It was the same way when it was X-Files. If it's not talking about the big narrative, it's like homework for me to sit through it and watch the whole thing. But the episodes that are talking about the larger narrative, I, I get totally into. And when you get into later seasons now, you're going to see fewer Good. of those of those Monster of the Week. Uh, and, and I'm watching it now, you know, the current episodes, and uh, it's this is the Walter season. Like if you, Good. I don't know if you like Walter. No, I love Walter. Don't you're tell gonna, me anything. You're going to get all anything. kinds of Walter. That's too you, much Walter. Get to the full current. frontal Walter. You're going to get the full Walter. <laughs> Do you watch Fringe? No, I don't. I and so many. I'm I'm such a purist. I don't have enough time, and I have to start at episode one and go all the way through. I mean, it's I just I don't have time, and and it's it's like like 24 is another one. I got the DVD box set sitting there waiting, and I just I haven't started it yet. Yeah, I'm saving 24 for my retirement for that very reason. <laughs> I just I don't want to start it until I know I can just sit did there. You, did you really miss the whole 24 experience? I never watched it, yeah. I, I wonder if it will be quaint and goofy to you to watch it I know, it now. yeah. That might I mean, be you know, I've thought about that, too, whether or not it will hold up when I finally get time to watch it, whether it will stand the test of time, depending on how long it takes for me to sit and watch it. I don't think I'll wait till my retirement, but... Um, <laughs> Is there yeah. anything you do watch regularly you want to mention? Yeah, I watch... Oh, well, Sunday Night TV on HBO is some of the best yeah. uh, from... Empire to you know everything that they have on Sunday nights. Um, Walking Dead. Um, I, I didn't. I'm not into zombie type you know a, a type of films or, or TV, but Walking Dead sucked me in. I, and I think it's so good because just anybody can kind of relate to that um, as far as you know what what would you do in some of those circumstances. This season's kind of a little wonky for me, uh, but. I'm, I'm still enjoying it. Uh, Dexter, I like Dexter a lot. Yeah. Although this season, I think it's jumped the shark a bit, but it's oh, starting really? to come around. Yeah, I mean, the first few episodes, I just, it's like the same thing over and over and over again. I thought that they could be a little bit more creative, but they're starting to come around now. And the previews for next week look like it's 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 going to be interesting. Uh, Boardwalk Empire, I'm in love with that now. Um, uh, I didn't think it was a little slow going at first, but it's one of those ones that's like slow burn and pulls you in. Um, and then you can't forget uh, uh, my favorite show growing up. It's back, Beavis and Butthead. It's like amazing, and, and I just laugh my ass off like like I did when, uh, when I was much younger watching it, and they're still funny as funny as ever. And the fact that they, they comment on reality TV uh, uh, more so than videos now, and they're saying everything that everybody already is saying or thinking, is, it's just classic. Excellent. Uh, I'm, I also caught the first episode of Homeland, 
uh, from Showtime and loved it. Oh, yeah, that's good, too. That's yeah, good. That, it's got Marina Bakker in. Oh, in it, wow, yeah. Uh, which I didn't even recognize her when she first came on. And, and I knew she was in the series, and then I was like, oh, wait. You know, she just looks totally different. Uh, great great show. I'm probably going to start watching the rest of those episodes. Although Showtime isn't making it easy for me to find them, to catch up, right? Because they're, they're, you know, I think they're like episode four or five now uh, into the season. And... Do they not have them online? I, I think they, 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 decent... they only have the first episode online on their website. I think they must have an app. But that's app like for free. Okay. That yeah. I have to go check out. But I'm a subscriber to Showtime. So and yet I still can't it. find the freak. You know, I'm paying <laughs> the money. Yeah. yeah. Make it you easy. Just on the iPad app and then like put it in and record both episodes. So like uh, old and or previous or whatever it is. Yeah, where it says that's, that's probably what I got to do. It's just, you know, I'm spoiled. I want it to just be there. Like, I don't care if I have to authenticate as a direct TV subscriber. Just. Make it easy, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to interference. Interferon is our web video segment. We just got one story to, to talk about real quickly here. Uh, another Hollywood deal for YouTube, but this is different than the one we talked about last week. Uh, this is one with Disney to make web videos available on YouTube. So they're not commissioning like full shows uh, like we were talking about previously. They're going to spend a combined $10 million to $15 million for new clips featuring characters like Swampy from Where's My Water, I don't even know. Uh, which is an iPhone app. Okay, uh, didn't even know. And, and so it's not just saying, well, we're going to clip out stuff mm. from shows we already air and then put clips on YouTube. They're actually going to create kids programming for YouTube. And, and every parent I talk to is like, yeah, my kid loves going on YouTube and just looking at clips. So I, I think this is brilliant. Uh, well, yes. And again, uh, however, you know, as, as the parent of a seven-year-old, now a four-year-old, uh, the the YouTube I I would love this if it was in its own app. I don't see why it has to be tied to YouTube because letting my kid run wild in YouTube in the, Wonderland oh, is wow. is not a comfortable place to be. Because again, as we talked about that from the SEO perspective, uh, you know I send my girl to watch the 1960s version of Spider Man, and before I know it, it's 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 colorful commentary on a 1960s episode with. You but know, if you kept her in a Disney Channel on YouTube, would that be as likely to I happen? I don't know. I don't know how the algorithms work, but yeah. I know that I know that I don't trust to go nuts on YouTube alone anymore. Uh, and if it was going to be on an iOS device, I'd rather see it inside their own app, inside a walled garden where I could feel good about letting them go nuts. Dana, what do you think of this deal? I, I think it's interesting. And, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, Craig Singer, he actually has a deal with Disney and has a, a studio in Hollywood where they're actually creating content for kids because it gets so much traffic. Um, and if you look at... Um, the Amazing Orange, I think it's called, uh, and the amount of traffic that that gets, and, yeah. and a lot of these yeah. these kids' uh, um, uh, clips that they watch, and they watch them repeatedly too. They don't just watch them once; they watch them over and over and over again. Um, I think I think it's a smart move on, on Disney's part, and it's and it's appealing to look. If you get an iPad now, a, a two-year-old can work an iPad and use it. Um, aside from the things that Brian points out, that you know, obviously there's places they can go that you, you, you don't want them to, uh, but like the, the, the Vivid app on Android. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's smart for them to basically adapt with the, their, their audience because that's, that's where they're watching and viewing it at, and so they, they might as well hit them where, where they're at. All right, let's finish up with some feedback. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> feedback. Got gotcha. you sleeping, Jason. Feedback with and Tom on the same day. Yeah. You can send us emails to frameratesshow at gmail.com and Don has one here. Says, first, a show routinely described by its host as about cord cutting without a host that has actually cut the cord is cray cray. Isn't Sarah Lane a cord cutter? Well, yeah, we had Sarah Lane on the show. Sure. Twice. But I think his point is, is like, you know, uh, in order to do a show about cord cutting, you have to uh, successfully cut the cord. We're trying, and that's the problem. Is, and we is have lots we of... We are about the most qualified individuals out there, but we're encountering all of these obstacles that keep us from being able to do what we want. We've had all kinds of cord cutters on the show. And, but yeah, we're talking about the sort of the obstacles that we're, that we're wanting to be able to use the Internet to watch our video, but these are the things that keep us from doing it. Uh, but Dan, Don goes on to say... All that cord cutty stuff can wait because you really must stop everything and devote your entire next show to a nonstop one breath rant about The Walking Dead. Seriously, The Walker in the Well, 
The cut to group pulls up 10 feet of rope. Cut to Glenn rises three feet. Cut to group okay. pulls up eight. Spoiler alert. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. No, okay. This is not a spoiler alert. The only spoiler word is there's some spectacularly bad television making in it. In that you see, like, get him out of the well. And you see one guy hand over hand pulling up rope. And then you see the yeah, guy in the well was, go up yeah, the foot. Up. It, was, it was ridiculous and terrible. Like, I could not believe it. Are you so you're still down on uh, uh, on, de this on was, dead? Still down on dead, Brian? <laughs> I liked this last episode. Oh, no, I I, this this was my favorite episode besides the first one. This is my favorite episode, maybe of the whole second season. Uh, having said that, uh, and just Robert Young, got to give him credit on the Weird Things blog. He pointed out where were we five episodes into the first season? The guy woke up. We discovered the zombie world. He had reunited with his family. Spoiler alert. Uh, and uh, uh, major, major things. And, and uh, you know, Shane's entire role within the group dynamic fundamentally shifted. We had big, big advancement in the story. What's happened this season? The kid is still missing. That's it's all we got. Crazy. I, I can't stand that. It's like, all right, it, let's just end that. And that the whole series now is about the kid being missing and whether or not they can find her or not. Like, that's, weirdly? That's not that, you hit a spot. I can't stand that. Weirdly, at this point, Justin and I were talking about this earlier. Like, I just want to see her dead. Like, just if it, if it will kill the plot, then kill the girl. I mean, it's, You've identified her with the plot. Yes, yeah. exactly. I don't want to hear about her. I want to hear more boo-hooing. And uh, in, was anybody, and we're in spoiler alert level, level red here, is there anybody who didn't read the comic who was surprised by the revolutionary turn of events that happened, uh, the, the big reveal with what's-her-name? Oh no no of course Lori, yeah. I mean right. did, did anyone yeah yeah no I I knew in fact Eileen who hasn't read the comic books with next to me called it yeah. she's like oh is she you know yeah and I'm like not talking right but yes totally now if you totally. want to go to spoiler alert the eleven mother, uh, mother of Walt's kid has become extremely annoying as well and it's like I, I, oh, I yeah. want her dead also I mean at first we had to deal with her with her husband and spoiler alert we had to deal with her husband and in and, and killing killing her spoiler alert level plaid <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> yeah. taking it to the max here. and now That's now her kid's max. missing she's bitching about everything I, I just she becomes annoying to me now granted her kid's missing but as uh, Brian said I almost want to see the kid dead now uh, horrible and and the one hookup scene, uh, I did enjoy it for what it was, but in the comic book, they they so conveyed this animalistic, any port in a storm, there are certain human needs, like, I have to go number three now, and you'll do. Uh, and uh, I didn't get that. <laughs> they, they portrayed her as some kind of temptress farmer's daughter, which I didn't mm. really enjoy. Yeah, I didn't love that. I tell you what, my, my only big problem with The Walking Dead right now, though, and, and everybody's like, well, if you read the comic book, you got to give that up. You know, because you're watching a TV show, sure, it's different. Sure, I totally, sure. I totally agree with that. But what I loved about the comic book was no one was safe. Yes. And you felt that all the time. And things would start to get better, and you'd start to breathe a sigh of relief, and then something horrible would happen. Right. And then they'd overcome it. And again, you wouldn't think they were going to, but they'd figure it out. And then something horrible would happen. And we're not having that kind of pacing this season. This is a very normal pace for a show. I'm not getting that feeling that no one is safe. We haven't had, we haven't lost a major character. Well, and let's episodes. face it, if there's one can hallmark... I, can I tell you how that, this would work out for me? You better put the banner back to red. I haven't read the, uh, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't read the uh, comic books, uh, uh, but if that, the only way this kid will work out for me is if this kid, when they find her, she's a, if they find her, she's a zombie, and she attacks her mother and affects her mother. That's the yeah. only way this will work for me. And then they can go off and be a happy zombie family together. All right, and now at this point if you have not read the comics, seriously plug your ears because the chat room, there's like three people shouting, why have they not looked in the barn yet? I mean, it's oh, like, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. how ridiculous is that, that that's not even a, a, a topic yet? Well, I thought that's where they were going with the well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought maybe that was just a twist. Right. But but yeah. it wasn't. Never mind. All right, that's it for this show. Uh, thanks everybody for watching. Dana Bernetti, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. It was great having you. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. It was fun. Let folks know about Trigger Street and where they can find all the stuff about you online. Sure. You can get me uh, on Twitter at Dana Brunetti. Uh, and you can get us uh, uh, for aspiring filmmakers and screenwriters and, uh, and just storytellers on labs.triggerstreet.com. Or if you go to triggerstreet.com, it'll redirect you there. And then our new uh, blog podcast site uh, that we've uh, just just launched, uh, Trigla. It's T-R-I-G-G dot L-A, Trigla L-A. Um, and uh, you can find just whatever we're up to there. Go check it out, folks. Uh, thanks to all of you for watching, too. You can email us. Again, our email address is frameratedshow at gmail.com. We will see you next time.
I actually thought that was John Reese Davies for a second. <laughs> he just looks so different. They look short. Oh, they have fun. 